Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We are here to keep you guys up on the literature and to do that, we spoon feed you. So what are we gonna talk about today? First off, the IDSA updated their guidelines on the treatment of COVID. We will tell you about them. Second, after 20 mLs per kg of blood products given for pediatric trauma, you should consider activating your massive transfusion protocol. Third, we have a spoonful review on serotonin syndrome. Fourth, careful when you give fluoroquinolones for a UTI. Resistant rates are as high as 20% across the US. And then from the last article, while it may save you a mess, tegaderms could be harming your ocular ultrasound images. If you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so you're not receiving the entire podcast, only receiving a portion of the past week summaries. Don't worry. I'm going to pick good ones for you, but if you would like to get full access to both the blog and the podcast, then you will have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And just so you know, if money is a barrier for you, just reach out and we'll help out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by Seth Walsh Blackmore, Vivian Leigh, Gabby Leonard, Jacob Atholtz, and Clay Smith. Okay, we're going to jump over to the second article. Titled, Recognizing Life-Threatening Bleeding in Pediatric Trauma, a Standard for When to Activate Massive Transfusion Protocol, out of the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery. Kids do great, until they don't. So it can be hard to differentiate between a little bit of hemorrhage and, like, life-threatening hemorrhage. If you had a clear critical administration threshold, then you might be able to predict when it would be appropriate to activate Massive Transfusion Protocol. And this would be, well, just easier to think of cognitively, as well as hopefully preventing poor outcomes. So this, what the authors called a critical administration threshold, would just be a point past which, if you're giving more blood than that, then you should really think about activating MTP. These authors did a retrospective cohort study on pediatric trauma patients in a level 1 urban trauma center. They had 287 patients, aged 0 to 17 years old, who got blood products within 24 hours of a traumatic injury. The median injury severity score was 26, and 83% of the traumas were blunt traumas. Now, the threshold that they ended up coming up with was 20 mLs per kg of blood products within one hour. That's pretty much equivalent to giving two units of PRBCs. This threshold optimized sensitivity and specificity for mortality, need for urgent surgery, or subsequent bleeding. The children that passed this threshold had pretty much worse outcomes across the board. Even after multivariate regression to control for injury severity score, age, GCS, and hypotension, they still had a 3.4-fold higher risk of mortality. So these authors proposed that the critical administration threshold could be 20 mLs per kg of blood products. Hopefully, they will, uh, you know, validate this prospectively as well. In a spoonful, in the first hour of pediatric resuscitation, if you're giving more than 20 mLs per kg of blood products, then these patients are at increased risk of mortality, interventions, and additional bleeding. This would be a good cutoff to really start considering MTP. And then we jump over to the fifth article. Titled, Covered or Uncovered, a randomized controlled trial of Tegaderm versus no Tegaderm for ocular ultrasound out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. I love doing ocular ultrasounds, they're so satisfying. Plus, aren't eyes cool? Like, I like eyes. I I think they're really neat. Now, as with any ultrasound technique, can't have too much gel. To make that easier on our patients, though, we tend to cover people's eyes with a tegaderm when doing an ocular ultrasound, you know, just to keep the eyes shut, make the patient a little bit more comfortable, and to hasten up the cleaning process. This adds an extra layer, though. Are we doing harm to our imaging? These authors got together 90 patients with headache or vision loss and had both their eyes imaged by an ultrasound fellow, one eye covered by a tegaderm and one eye with no tegaderm, just straight gel. The images were stored and later interpreted by a blinded ultrasound fellowship trained physician on a five-point scale of diagnostic acceptability and overall image quality. They also got self-reported comfort levels from the patients. Overall, the image quality was poorer with the tegaderm, 3.4 versus 4.3 on the 5-point scale. And accordingly, there was also kind of a lower um, percentage that met the threshold for diagnostic acceptability, 82 versus 98%. That said, 91% of these patients were complaining of headaches, 
and no diagnoses were ever discussed in the paper. I think the really high yield stuff for ocular ultrasounds, at least for emergency physicians, is to rule out things like retinal or vitreous detachments. So I'm not wholly convinced that a tegaderm here was really going to change much of your diagnostic yield. I was surprised to hear that patients actually reported identical comfort scores. So maybe when you're doing this, you're not necessarily doing it for your patient's benefit, but maybe just your own. Keep in mind that ophthalmologists don't close their patient's eyes at all. They ultrasound the eye directly. So how bad could it really be doing it the emergency department way, just through the eyelid, you know, either way? Maybe on my next patient, I'll patch one eye and not the other, and then run my own little experiment, see what I feel, how it looks different in my own hands, and how my images are changing. In a spoonful, ER, patching ye eye for an ultrasound to be more trouble than it's worth. Sorry, couldn't resist. All right, let's do the wrap up. What did we learn today? Second, a good time to call for a pediatric MTP might be after 20 mLs per kg of blood products. These patients are particularly at risk. And then from the last article, patching the eye with a tegaderm prior to doing an ocular ultrasound reduced image quality without improving patient comfort. Could be a waste of plastic. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org. And remember that the newsletter is the best way to get the most out of this podcast by making it a little bit of space repetition. Now, if you feel like you're missing out, you want to hear more podcasts, then come over and join us at the members feed. Our goal here is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time.